Channel 3 is the future. Welcome, crew, to What Are Your Three, a Channel 3 podcast where we take a member of the Channel 3 community, discuss three games of their choosing, go through some honorable mentions, some other odds and ends, have a nice little video game discussion. I'm Dan. With me, as always, Ray. What's going on, everybody? Tonight's guest basically shows up because of the collection of games that they've talked about, like the games that they've requested to kind of add into our library. They were just different. And we said, well, let's let's get this person on. Let's talk about these games. So it is the one and only Toron Upon. How are you doing today? Pretty, pretty good, all things considered. We are happy to have you here. And we're going to jump right into these games. And of course, when I say, hey, all these new and cool different games. So we're going to start with Splatoon 3. Totally new and different. No one's ever talked about this game before. Clearly. Uh, this is, is this like your top game? It's definitely the one I feel you've posted the most about on Channel 3. So uh, part of that is because I play Splatoon 3 competitively. So I've got my own team. We go to low level tournaments and stuff. And I do some coaching on the side for other teams as well. So it's it's one I play often. <laughs> no doubt. You've you've posted up you just posted recently how you have twenty four star weapons now. Uh there'll be twenty one at this point. Last be- Friday I was able to get another uh another four star. So, so is is this kind of like a, is it like, is that like a side thing to just to be able to say, hey, I can play all these different weapons? Because I would think being on a on a professional team, you you probably lock in on like a a certain couple of weapons that, that are your best with, right? So yeah, there's I, I do have my main weapons like Dynamo Roller, Heavy Edit, Ballpoint, ones I'm really good at. But all these extra ones, it really just me either learning something new for fun or trying to kind of just broaden my horizons. Does learning the new weapons, I would assume, does that help you against opponents, kind of having an idea of what they are going to do with the weapons? Oh, most definitely. That's part of the reason I have started playing so many weapons is because I can learn the strategies of others. Once you know how to play a weapon in Splatoon, most other people are going to play that weapon very similarly or exactly the same. So you can really start to lock down on how they're going to play. And so let's move back. Splatoon 3, is this like, did you just kind of jump into this game here or have you been a fan of the the series? So I've been a fan of the series since the very first game. I went out and got it on release day and have been playing the series ever since. When, when did it become, when did you like have an idea of, hey, maybe I'm pretty decent at this and I kind of want to see how far I can go with it? So, um, all all the way up until Splatoon 3, it, I was really just a casual player. I played for most of the lifespan of the game, and then dropped it once support dropped. Went on to other things. But once I started playing Splatoon 3, uh, my high school actually started uh, an esports team. Right around the start of the game. So a few of my friends kind of came in and they were bugging me, trying to get me to join the team. And towards the end of the year, I finally gave in and joined the team. Uh, little did I know, I was the best person on the team and almost instantly was given the role of captain upon joining. And it just kind of grew from there. How do how does a Splatoon team set up? Obviously, you know, I know it's the foursomes. Um, are there specific roles on the team? Like, is there some per- one person kind of directing everybody to the support roles? Like, what, how does how does that breakdown happen? So, um, there's roughly five different uh, like weapon roles. You have your slayer, your support, your skirmisher, your swit, and one other which I can't remember. So it's probably not that important. <laughs> but um, typically. You have 
uh, a team of one back line, a couple front lines, and someone who kind of sticks towards the middle. And it can be any combination of the roles I had just mentioned. But you just try and balance it out so you've got one person who's usually playing support, a couple frontliners, and one who's just kind of there to switch up on however the situation happens to shake out. What's what's your role, Jeffrey, when you're playing? So I typically play the uh, the switch role or midline because that's just what I feel more com- most comfortable in. Like uh, Dynamo is a weapon that's got a lot of range, but uh, does really bad in, in a close up fight. But it can if it really has to. So I usually just kind of hang around, try and support the teammates, and then. When push comes to shove, I push forward and kind of drive a push. I oh just want to ask, like, what? Go ahead, because I've literally what, what I'm did you play? Right what did you play that led up to this? That you know gave you the skills, the talents. Like, I, I listen. You, the fact that you were in high school and Splatoon was there. I'm aware this is a real old yeller situation for me, and Ray just wants to tie me to the shed and, and end it, but. Uh, what I'm just curious about, like, I, I jumped in in two and tried to play two, and and I I'll, I'll dabble in three, and I you know I know that the jubes of the world out there and and the really good Splatoon players tell you motion controls are the way to go. I have not had experience in motion controls in my life, right? That like that say, hey, listen, here's how I'm gonna here's how I'm gonna play this, and the best Splatoon players have that, which I assume you know you do, but right, yeah. You know, so so what? What was it? Was it just like Splatoon got your attention, got your time, you grinded with it? Did you just have something click? Like, how how did that happen? Not being old like, was step one. Congratulations. You nailed that one. <laughs> Thanks, Ray. I saved like, you an answer there. But don't pre- don't worry. Tor, Tor can take shots at you, Ray. Just, I just you're real cool. careful where you tread today. Your question is way better than the question I was going to ask. I remember it now, but yours is way better. Let's go with that. So, like, are we, are we thinking, like, how did I make the push to become a competitive player? Yeah, just like, was there or something like, that led to it? Because Splatoon's different. Like, I mean, you know, you have your 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 shooters, your first-person shooters over time, your over-the-shoulders, all this stuff, but Splatoon brought in the element of the motion controls, which, like, the we had motion control games before that, but it's not the same as the way... None of it felt, felt the same the way that you play Splatoon. Like, none of it... Like, you did motion controls in a first-person shooter. You didn't move the entire screen with you the way that Splatoon moves. Like, you would just point at the screen. You wouldn't be... There's a different way that Splatoon feels and handles, and how did you get your brain to adapt to that to the to the point of being useful? <laughs> um, so, really, I think it kind of boils down to the first game. The first game, you're... Whenever you play any of the Splatoon games, you're immediately forced to use motion controls right out of the get-go. You can turn them off once you get out of the tutorial, but uh, they force you to start with them at least. So when I played one, I never turned them off. And I just kind of learned. And from there, it became muscle memory. I, I bought a controller just to, because I didn't have one with motion controllers. I bought a motion controller just for Splatoon. I mean, to, to me, it feels like a mouse. Like it, it feels like the same thing. I'm just clicking button. I'm just I'm clicking the trigger instead of the mouse, essentially. That's how that's how it feels. Right. I just have to hold the mouse with two hands and and not shake my hands to make sure I'm pointing in the correct direction at all times. So, sorry, this has just reminded me of something uh, funny. The first Splatoon game, one of their recommended uh, controller options was you to take a Wii U Pro Controller and to rubber band a Wiimote to the back of it to get motion controls with a physical controller. That was an official controller style for Splatoon One. Dan, you had the Wii U. I don't. I don't even. I don't. Even no, I didn't. That. You didn't have a Wii U? No. Oh, good. Oh, that geez, was the Dark dude. Ages for me, anyway. Like the Dark oh, Ages. The Wii U lasted so so short. My kids were born, and that was, and it was in and out. Like so. Oh, the the, the oh, Wii U came and went okay. and died. I don't know what to tell you. <laughs> how does how does pr- practice work? Do you play like do do you play rank mode? Sometimes I feel like. Some pro players end up not playing rank. They do more kind of custom games to practice. Do you, how do you how do you go about practicing and just kind of playing? So, usually for solo practice, I will 
almost always run either Anarchy, which is their standardized rank modes, or X Battles, which is like the high tier uh, ranked modes. When when I practice with my team, usually we'll run uh, Anarchy just because it's really easy to run that. Sometimes we'll go on to like Sendu Inc., which is the competitive hub for Splatoon, and we'll play against other teams. And sometimes we'll jump into private battles and play against each other just to like practice our call outs and notice how each of us play so we can find our downsides and build off of that. So as somebody who has 21 four star weapons, are there any any weapons that that you say that you say no there's like we don't use these in ranked in in our in our pro games like there's just no point to this one? Um there's definitely a lot of those, but Splatoon does a really good job at making all the weapons pretty balanced so that if you're really good with a weapon that's typically considered pretty bad, you can still do very well with it. And let me let me finish with a question that has nothing to do with any of this multiplayer talk whatsoever. <laughs> I feel like the stories in these games don't get talked about a lot. Do you do you enjoy the story? You just made a face like that's crazy. You do you enjoy the stories of these games? I mean, I love I I never opened the story. I don't play that much, but I feel like I never hear much about the story mode in these games because the multiplayer does so well and can do so many things. Right. The the multiplayer is definitely the main mode, but the story modes are not something that should be slept on. The the way that Nintendo is able to craft the lore and story of Splatoon, they almost do it in a way without telling it to you. The first two games, their main story modes were, um, what you call you, some old guy finds you, a random kid off the street, and tells him to go fight the Octarians. Like that's the main story. But all the lore is gathered through secret collectibles throughout the levels in the form of sunken scrolls, which is a really unique way of doing that, and it works really well. Uh, Splatoon 2 Octo Expansion kind of builds on that, where you're kind of shuttled through these little challenges, and a lot of the lore is gotten through these in-between-the-challenges. There's like a, like a text messages you can read between multiple characters, which give you a lot of lore. And when you complete a challenge without uh, skipping it or restarting it, you get a little thing called the Mem Cake, which have little bits of lore because they're supposed to be extracted memories. Splatoon 3 um, kind of does something similar. Um, once you fully complete each area by completing every level, you get a, a like a data log, which you get to read, which kind of tells you about the downfall of humanity and how that plays into the story which is all right. Uh, side order does the kind of the exact same thing where you uh, complete enough weapons throughout the challenges and you'll get dev logs, which talk about the members and all that. But the main story building in Splatoon, at least that I love, is the backgrounds of the multiplayer stages. There is so much lore hidden in the background of multiplayer stages it's it's shocking how much they were able to fit in without actually telling you anything. One of the new stages they added in three, uh, Lemuria Hub, is the final stage. You can see a train station map in the background, and players were able to use that map to basically tie together the entire world, which we had never done before that map had been released. Any Any chance for a Splatoon 4? I think... Well, I think it's extremely likely. It's one of Nintendo's top online games. A lot of the reasons that people think they aren't going to do a 4 is because the storyline from Splatoon 1 through 3 has all been connected. And it has been confirmed that this will be the end of that storyline. But it, they never said that we wouldn't get a 4. So I think it's luck. I think it's pretty likely on the upcoming system. Whatever that may be. Listen, the the Legend of Zelda will will continue to link stories, one way or the other, regardless of how many times it, it may have finished or not finished. So, Watch your tone, Ray. Yeah, it's like you tell me all they've they've, they've completed the story of one through three is 
It's completely meaningless to, to Nintendo. We'll say that right now. All right, that's fair point. <laughs> A mystery untold, a journey through ancient caverns, inner turmoils that become outward strengths. These kinds of stories need a solemn yet comforting pack of music to bring the players closer to your characters as they set forth on a mysterious journey. My name is Adam Evolt, otherwise known as Cast the Garden, and I just put out my first music asset pack over on itch.io called Neo Classical Mystery. It is available for download for your next indie game dev project. I hope these tracks find you well, and it is time to unfold your mystery. All right, well, let, let's move on to your second game, Xenoblade Chronicles 2, 4.1 rated on Channel 3, but I think we're just going to start off asking about your username based on this one. All right, so during my first playthrough of Xenoblade, you know, I got to Torgoth, and you meet Tora, and he was... At that point in the story, like, I don't know, before the first half, he's the comic relief. He's just there to be funny. He's there to lighten the mood. And I was like, cool. I really like this character. Later in the game, um, he is the most powerful character in the entire game and can kill super bosses in one special move. He is destroyer of worlds in the Xenoblade 2 world specifically because of how uh, Monolith Soft decided to make his character customization. So that ended up becoming my username. I'm I'm amazed you were able to get it that many you know that many places. I feel like that was something that would be taken pretty easily, but you're you're able to <laughs> jump right on that. Yeah. So I w I want to start with this one yeah, you had the Wii U. You, did you play the original Xenoblade Chronicles on the Wii? I'm really just kind of curious. You know, you've got, from a Chronicles perspective, you've got one, two, three. You've got X in here, so you've kind of got the the four right. core games in this set. And obviously, you know, there's there's a a larger universe that that's out there. But you picked two for a reason. I'm curious what that reason is. So, out of all the games I played through them all, I loved them all, but two left a mark on me. I think it is easily one of my favorite games of all time, if not my favorite game of all time. It's just something special about everything in the game that just really left a mark on me. This, from a an RPG perspective, Xenoblades is part of the ongoing trend of their more action oriented, right? They're, they're not turn-based. The action's happening here. Xenoblades, if yeah. I, if I may go so far as to make a generalized comment about the series, much heavier in the cinematics than a lot of other series are. I think like you've, I, frankly, like by the time you get to three, there's like 30 minute unbroken <laughs> cutscenes, oh, basically. Absolutely. So you're, you're, and, uh, you're in a cinematic experience as much as anything, right? Uh, yeah, uh, a close friend of a uh, close friend of mine who absolutely loves the series. Uh, him and I often uh, poke fun at the fact that how you can sit down and start playing, and thirty minutes in, and you're still going to watch the same cutscene. <laughs> but yeah, I, I think uh, I heard the end of three. I did. I did not play through three. I'm I'm working on one again. Uh, but uh, I think I heard like forty five minutes. Like no joke in three towards the end you've got a straight cutscene that's 45 minutes long something that's over oh yeah there's, there's a couple of those <laughs> yeah that's that is something else altogether so all right so jumping back here how did you wander into the series as a whole so a, a youtuber i watch was this was back right when the game released uh he was he uh he was paid by nintendo or at least sent, was sent a copy to kind of drum up some hype for it yeah, they used to have a pretty yeah. big like uh, uh, program as far as like a lot of folks they would have out there. They would send copies and stuff. Yeah, to it yeah, was kind of very big that back. Bit. Yeah, yeah, very big back when uh, Xenoblade Two released. But he picked up the game, and uh, he could not get very far because, frankly, the game has terrible tutorials. There's a lot of issues within the first like two or three chapters that if you don't know how to play the game, you're going to struggle. But 
Um, from the little bit that I saw of the game within the first couple chapters in him struggling so much to get through it, there was something about the world and the music and the characters that just captivated me. So I was like, I'm going to do it. I bought the game and uh, the rest is history. So, I, I mean, they're, they're relatively independent. So had you not played one or X? Cause I, I just kind of assumed that you would have played X on the Wii since you, my first question was going to be, you, did you have a Wii U? But with Splatoon, you did, obviously. Yeah. But had you had you not played any of the Xenoblade games before that? No, Xenoblade 2 was my introduction to the series. Nintendo's got to bring that program back. They, 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 they were desperate at the end of the Wii U days, and this was an early entry for the Switch days, so they were still there. But by, what, 2019, I think oh, yeah. they, had, they, they had whacked that program. They said, we don't need this anymore. We're riding high, baby. <laughs> we're, we're good. Oh, yeah. Switch came out, they post it now. <laughs> so have you gone back and played uh, the other games in the series at this point, or are you just uh, rolling with uh, 2B? Oh, yeah, I have I've went back and played uh, everything but X, because X is kind of removed, and it's on the Wii U, and I don't really feel like booting that up and playing through that right now. Even, you're the closest thing I we did. had to a full Wii U supporter, <laughs> and even you just leave it in the box, huh? <laughs> Look, I love the Wii U. It was a huge part of my childhood. But it's the Wii U. It's... I loved watching Ray get kicked in the teeth when you said that. That was that was great to see someone else go through that. That's a beautiful thing to see. It was like, it, it was like you yanked Ray's beard and just pulled it into his microphone and slapped his face off of it. Nice job, Tora. What 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 exact age range are you? Because it... um, I'm I'm current. I'm 18 right now. Oh, 18. You're even younger than I thought. Okay, amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Ray Ray's not good at math. It felt no. Well, it felt like I was talking. It, it feels like I'm speaking, not not just uh, stylistically to my youngest brother, but even he's twenty four now. So yeah, yeah, I'm old. Don't I worry, got... I'm I'm an I'm an old soul in a young body. I'm sure I'm sure as you have seen from my collection. Let me tell you, that's not helping me at all. All right, you know what? I, I can't go any further than like I I have to ask because I was I had it down in the quest section. I'm like we got to talk about the collection, but like. No, I'm, we're we're sidebarring. We're breaking format here, and I need to understand this. I need to understand how you amass this collection. You, you. I mean, you have been sharing things like store demo units, and you have <laughs> prototypes from vendors of yeah. like silk screen promotional materials, or not even. I, I don't even know if some of them were promotional or intended for sale, but whatever. Like, you had what was it? A Zelda and the Spirit Tracks, like promotional right. screen printed case. It was a it was a demo case that never made it to production. How like what what how what explain explain this that because you 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 it's not that you just share like oh I have this one case like you share this holding a picture in front of a shelving unit of just <laughs> like the entire mother collection, including games that were not released in the United States and and I tagged Rad Dad in one of the posts because he, he's the the, the biggest earthbound mother fan I know of in general. And you've just got this other stuff casually in the background. So it's not like, Oh yeah, I got, the, I got my hands on this one demo unit from a store. I got my hands on this one, you know, I think I got tossed in a dumpster behind a random, uh, a random promotional company. Like you've got a, you've got a pile of this stuff and it's, it's neatly organized. I don't mean pile. Like you've got a very neat orderly collection with a wide variety of materials in there. I need to understand what happened, how, and why. All right. So uh, it all started with, uh, believe it or not, Skylanders. So it. back when Skylanders was in the height of its popularity, I oh, freaking yeah. loved it. It had tons and tons of stuff. Eventually, I stopped playing it. So we brought it into a local um, local like video game store. It was kind of in the ghetto. It's in rough area so we brought all of our stuff there and we traded it in and according to the store owner uh i had the spot of most in-store credit of all time because of the trade-in because there was just so much oh you and sold early then sure too I, yeah so i'm pretty sure i still hold that title uh we still talk about it today but uh I went to that store and I ended up buying Game Boy Advance and a bunch of random uh, Game Boy games. From there, I just kind of 
continued to collect, whether it was more Game Boy games, some other stuff. Eventually, I moved on. Like, my, my parents wanted me to experience, like, what they had for when they were kids. So I got an NES, SNES, N64, got all the extra stuff. Did it get you then, the wood panel CRT TV to go with it, too, or...? I don't even mean, uh, like, the whole family we, we, room unit that's not, like, a, a three-foot-wide one. Do they just get you, like, the wood panel, like, a, a station wagon box there? Um, yes. My grandmother did have a CRT, which we took, and that became what I played everything on. So, like, after we got all those uh, home consoles, uh, it was a few years before we actually continued to collect anything. Uh, we moved into a new house and we had we had an upper loft which wasn't used so we uh, decided to throw up some shelves and start collecting again we at the start we would just buy big bundles um take the few things that we wanted and sell the rest and make back the money uh eventually that turned into uh switch switch trades during covid because switches were all the all the rage then so we would buy switches post them on facebook and say we'll trade you for any vintage video games you got and that really bolstered our collection after that we started to go to uh video game conventions like uh the midwest gaming classic uh ccag some of the other ones in our area and we started to get some more like heavy hitters and we started to see people with these like store displays and stuff that would bring them in and showcase their collections. We then found somebody local with a World of Nintendo store display cabinet. Like that would be in like a Toys R Us, uh, Best Buy, KB Toys, whatever. And then you don't get to that use that name and... KB Toys and act like, no, you don't get to do that. Go on. All right. <laughs> So uh, we, from from that point, we continued to collect more and more, and our collection just grew. And now we're kind of to today where most of the stuff we're getting is either very rare or something super obscure, like the Super Mario Brothers Power Shower Showerhead, or uh, prototype game cartridges, or prototype cases, or... A complete in box copies of Earthbound. Sorry, I had to Google the vintage Super Super the Mario Brothers shower power handheld shower. Ages six and up with built in scald protection. protection. Yes. Oh my god. Oh, that that's, is that's one of my favorite things in the collection. <laughs> So was this something the family was doing kind of before all of that? You just kind of had some of it lingering and then just went to overdrive? Um, kind of. It was, we, my family didn't, we didn't really have many hobbies when we were moving into our new house. So uh, vintage video game collecting just kind of became my father and I's hobby. And it just kind of spiraled out from there. And now we're on to arcades. So nice. you can say we like our kids. We we like video games. <laughs> Fair enough. I just I, I had questions and, and again so the, the things you have teased us with are beautiful in the background, just so we're clear. It's it's well guys, organized, maintained. It's, yeah. I can't I can't wait. Um but back to back to Xeno. Back to back to Xenoblade. So Xenoblade and uh, the, the series there. Um so just like, are, are these the characters that stuck with you most? This was the story that stuck with you mo- the most? It was just like that impactful when you got to the end? Of- like, it's you're, you're running a marathon with this one. This is not a short game. This is a game you're spending oh, yeah. time with these characters. Everybody's getting an arc in the game. Oh, yeah. Um, it, it's easily an 80-hour game. At least that was what it took me to just get to the end of the story, not doing any of the extras. But um, it was definitely... The characters, the environments, the gameplay that just really stuck with me. And specifically, the music. Something about Xenoblade 2's music compared to the rest of the series 
blows me out of the water to this day. It's one of the best composed soundtracks I've ever heard. And I think that's part of the reason why I love the game so much. Yeah, the music can go a long, <clears throat> can go a long way. There's no question about that. Um, and again, there's a lot of stuff happening in the game too. And uh, you get the, the combination there where the music starts to just remind you of things. The music can be listened to independently of the, of the right. game itself. It, it can be, it can be big. Yeah. There's the, the, the world itself and how much of the game there is. It's definitely a vast world to explore. There's so many secrets to find so many areas to explore enemies to encounter unique monsters which i would like to get to in a sec but another thing or another part about it that really sticks with me is the blade quests every rare blade in the game gets their own storyline so it's not just the main characters it's not just the main blades it's every like minor major character they get their complete their own complete storyline that talks about their history what they want to accomplish it's it adds so much to the game and unless you're on top of it you usually don't get to see that in your first playthrough so let's talk the let's talk the monsters let's talk the unique creatures uh, in this one because so, there there's a lot of uh again you can see inspiration from other media across anime okay. across other across other mediums but you see it with a lot of these the beasts the monsters the machines that you're coming across and um I, I know that some of the voice performances get a little bit knocked in this one but i think they generally have uh generally when you're dealing with the villains and the monsters and the the bad guys you got some pretty good voice acting that's happening with some of those i think yeah um so uh, I'll, I'll get to monsters in a second but voice acting first um yeah there's definitely there's some rough parts of the voice acting some people don't like it i like it i think it's good and something that really makes me laugh is the main villain also did uh percy from thomas the tank engine <laughs> and no matter how many times i think about that it never ceases to put me on the floor laughing I'm so angry at you for putting that song in my head now. All right. So uh, unique monsters. Part of what makes Xenoblade 2's worlds or Xenoblade as a series in the world so immersive and so memorable are the unique monsters that you find along the way that have special names. Some of my favorites being Territorial Rothbart and Machine Gun Julio. The Machine Gun Julio is a bird. It has no mechanics. It's just a bird. But uh, all these unique monsters give you these optional challenges throughout your playthrough. They above their like uh, their their name. They have like a little header that marks them as a different enemy, so you know when you're encountering a unique monster. And typically, they're much higher level than the area that you're currently in, so you have to come back to fight these things. But, but again, you, you, you can see you them coming. You don't just get ambushed. You're not stuck there. You're able to escape. So it's not one of those things like my game is ruined because I got cornered here. So, yeah. Well, for the uh -oh. most part. Uh -oh. <laughs> uh, in the first area, I, I mentioned Territorial Rotbart earlier. This is a massive, like, eight-foot story gorilla that will actively hunt you down from halfway across the map. And you will most definitely... Uh, die to it your first playthrough because it just patrols the main path to the first town so most of the time you can see them coming except the rotbart which will attack you and this has been a joke throughout the entire series each game has had a giant gorilla that is there to pummel you but uh other than that when you can see them coming you know and you typically make a mental note and when you come back you you can take them out and you get really really good gear so you are very greatly rewarded for backtracking and coming back and fighting these unique monsters and you can fight them as many times as you want once you take them out once a little gravestone appears and you can actually speed run your takedowns of them because it marks your your time 
So just let me be dead in peace. No, no, I will not. <laughs> yeah, bring him back. Take him out again. Ray, I want so, to ask you a question. Yeah, uh, real yeah, quick question for Ray. Uh, Ray, this is a game, again, probably about an 80 hour base story. You can easily cross 100, close to a buck 20. Uh, you're talking about uh, a wide color palette. The scope of some of these creatures you're battling is mentioned. You're, you're talking about the size of buildings and and you're engaging them and you're seeing wide vistas and seeing across the map and there's active environments and things that are happening, whether you're there or not, they're, they're kind of in motion. Things are happening. How big do you think the file size is for this one on the switch? Oh, for, oh on the oh. switch, the ZW2? Let's see. I, I, um, I want to say that Nintendo decides to not be as efficient with this as they are with their biggest game. So let's go with, let's go with 20 gigs. Let's say 20. Tori, this is an obsession of ours since we found out that Breath of the Wild was like, I mean, uh, Tears of the Kingdom Tears. was like a, a six or eight gigabyte game uh, with right. the scope of it. and uh, Mario Wonder was like a four gigabyte game that uh, you, you can't get updates yeah. for a lot of games that are that size right. anymore. But, uh, do you know how big this one is, Tori? I, based on download size, because... Uh, you know, maybe not the smartest choice. I bought it digitally at first. I, I buy everything copy now. I buy everything digital. But, That's a great choice. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but I want to say it's forty plus, just based on the download size. Yeah, it just down- sucks up so much size on the Switch. I think the download straight. might be a little bigger. The card itself is thirteen. I think Ray. Thirteen. Even that, see, even, even I, I mean, look. you know what? Even with tears being, you know, something, it's like double. It's almost double tears, depending on where you get, where it is. So, like I said, not as efficient, but still smaller than I thought. Yeah, I need, to, I need to double check card. this. Yeah, physical physical cartridge for that's thirteen gigs. The download the download's going to be a little different. But uh, yeah, thirteen thirteen point two to thirteen point seven is the switch yeah. file size. And there's a lot in that game. Go ahead. I can't. Oh, yeah. I can't wait till Call of Duty so drops in a few weeks, and it's a, a two hundred and fifty. First of all, game. well, they've already they've already announced. Yeah, I know. They, they took it down a peg. I know. I know. No, 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 no. <laughs> New announcement. They said, "Hey, we're going to set it up so that you can download um, in pieces." They are. They already announced you can download Call of Duty Black Ops Seven uh <laughs> coming start, out in four years out. so it'll be start, ready for you then. Downloading now. no but it says six you'll though you'll basically be able to download sections of it because it's so long because they just know like that they can't they can't Sorry. be like hey just go like get 200 at once i think they're gonna like section it off hey you can download this piece of it and then this piece later on in a couple of years get that last piece as sorry, sorry Tor, I've, I've derailed your, your Xeno <laughs> conversation here uh, with just one. You, you crossed into the, the collection and two, that, that just the... I, because I got curious, I never size. looked up what the file size of this thing is. And yeah, it's, it's every, Everywhere I'm seeing is a 13, 13, under 14 gig file size. Nintendo, I think Nintendo really needs to start. I think they need to push that topic more and just let people know like we just like we're just more efficient than everyone they don't else. brag that's just they don't not talk their, about it that's they not never that's a company culture it. thing you're never going to see it they're not going to do it it's they're not going to brag. very true that's that's why they still don't talk to sony like ever since i'm telling you, you crash bandicoot <laughs> crashing their their company cafeteria they've never forgiven they've never <laughs> forgiven those ads from the 90s <laughs> the arrogance of them <laughs> Tora, any any parting thoughts on Xeno? How do you sell somebody? How do you sell somebody on Xenoblade Chronicles again? We're, because it can be intimidating, right? Like we we talk, we talk it's, with some yeah. folks. Like, listen, the, these 80, 100 hour games, it's it's a commitment that's required there. The Switch is a selling point for me because like you can take it with you. You don't have to be strapped right. down to the TV. I do think if you're on the TV though, you can appreciate the vistas. You can appreciate the color oh, yeah. and the scope of everything. Uh, but but sell sell somebody on this. So, Xenoblade is. Mm. I'm trying trying to find the best the best way to encapsulate everything that the game does in like a short little statement. It's it's a journey about freedom almost. You you take this group of ragtag people, uh, a kid working a salvaging job. 
a former terrorist, uh, a member of the like royal army, uh, an exiled prince, and oh, who else we got? Some random guy who saved you from the government, and you take this crew and take on the world. It's from every environment that every environment you travel through is beautiful in its own right. And these these grand worlds draw you in and make you feel like you're part of the story. Like you're you're feeling everything that these characters are feeling as you experience it all. It's it's an experience that I don't think any other game, at least that I have played, has been able to capture. It's it's truly something special. And Monolith continues to make those experiences. Excellent. Well, let, let's go a different direction now, sort of slightly, like step aside here. Your third game you've picked to discuss with us here is Under Hero. Again, not Undertale, just so everyone is clear. Under Hero. <laughs> a very different color palette to this game, for, <laughs> first and foremost, uh, most importantly, but a, a side scrolling uh, 2D role playing game. Um, some quirky characters in here. Another game I'm guessing the music is going to come up for as the soundtrack is a, a pretty big one here, but I think this one came out in 2020. And so, you know, we're, we're, we've taken a wide journey here from Splatoon 3 and, you know, online Nintendo shooter to an epic role, action role-playing game. And now we're going into Under Hero. Um, so you, and this was a swap for you. You had swapped this with another game say that under hero was taking the slot right right uh, yeah so Did initially my thought was yeah my, my initial thought was to put in it'll do which is uh one of my favorite little puzzle games but it's kind of on the don't, don't take raise don't take like, raise thunder he's he's got he's ready for that game we're, we're still covering it <laughs> right. so don't go don't go ready. too we'll, deep there i am ready we'll, 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 we got we'll get, to throne we'll it later it'll do got to throne so uh yeah under hero is it, really it's really special for an indie game like it's, it's it's hard to describe because it takes everything that like your normal hero adventure would take like you're the hero you're gonna go take out the bad guy save the princess and flips it on its head so like you know you first start as the hero and you're you're walking through the bad guy's castle and you're you get your triumphant walk to the final boss room, and you are basically the Goomba of this world. You're placed right before the final boss to drop some health potions, and basically, you're just there to die. So, you know, the hero walks up and is stopped by your two co-workers, also two practically Goombas, and you drop a chandelier on all of them. You take out the hero, you take out your two... Uh, you're two minions in yeah. <laughs> a very bloody uh, sequence. It, they're gone. They're paste. But uh, you then walk over and you pick up the basically the the hero's weapon. And you get uh, another enemy comes up and reports you to the boss. He congratulates you, and you're kind of set out on your adventure to set up for the next hero. But really, you're building up your strength to take on the final boss. Turn-based combat. Back for this one. Timing. This one. This one's got a rhythm element, right? You get you you get bonuses for attacking with a beat. So yeah, that's it's kind of a it's a side mechanic in this game, but every overworld song is also the battle song. So you get to hear the same song the whole time. And once you get into a battle, it you get a little bit of an extra beat. But when you hit with the beat, you deal extra damage. You get a, a groovy hit. But um, it's not at all a mechanic that you need to master to do well at the game. I've played through the game like eight times and I've done fine without mastering it. So it's an extra little play. So it's game. I, there, there's visually, there's some comps to monster boy for me. Um, that, that I, I kind of get that vibe from it. I haven't played this one personally yet, though. I'm, I'm very intrigued by this one because it gets a, 
it's a manageable size. It appears we'll say <laughs> we'll say in here in the grand scheme of things, but also you know I, I I've talked a few times and I talked about Xenoblade having life and color and Splatoon has the same thing. You don't have the Skyrim of the world. You don't have the Fallout gray drab games here. You've got right. you've got your neons in here. You've got your your, your <laughs> color and flourish to these things. Um, I, I'm I'm very intrigued by by this. So my question for you is, how did you find this one? All right. So, um, one, one of somebody I watched on YouTube was randomly just one summer day doing a live stream on this game. It was only in the, like the first area. He didn't, doesn't play games for very long, but, um, I basically clicked on it. I was bored and everything about the game kind of captured me. It was a really unique take, at least to me on an RPG, making it a like almost a 2d platformer rather than like your standard like almost chrono trigger like walking around find an enemy you fight him on the field it's you still fight him on the field but it's in a 2d setting which makes things really interesting yes yeah, it's, it's not like zelda 2 where yeah you had the side scrolling element of it but this this one goes still has right. this one has a, a stopped element to it you still have turn-based action for this right yeah so you come across an enemy or in your case, one of your coworkers, and you you come to a full stop. You can you can talk to them, you can bribe them to not fight you, and then you basically you start the fight from there. You can do a bunch of actions before you fight, and then once you get into the fight, you're locked into the fight, and you can attack with multitude different of different things. Like you can use sword, you can use slingshot, you can use hammer, however you want. Slingshot range, hammer. Uh, slow but powerful sword your standard attack and it just I don't know something about it was interesting to me and made me want to play it because I'm I'm sucker for indie games by way too many love them all hey, yeah you're, you're more than welcome here in that case again for a game that like I think high end <laughs> is 15 or 16 dollars and available all over the place yeah that's <laughs> you can't argue some of these things <laughs> Uh, especially just wander, you find somebody who's playing, uh, find somebody who's playing and you want to check it out. So, so the soundtrack, tell me about the soundtrack for this one. Cause that's something that this game is, is pretty well known for. So the soundtrack is incredible. <laughs> um, like I said, again, there's a lot of the songs are like, you, you hear the songs for quite a while because the, your main area themes are also your main battle themes. So, like, the first area, you're going to hear that for, like, a solid, hmm, trying to think. First area takes, like, an hour and a half. So you're hearing that song for quite a while. It's just every composition in the game is so good. I don't, I can't off the top of my head think of any bad ones. I love the uh, the Chapter 3 songs, specifically the, uh, I think it's called, like, as green as the jungle or something or as green as green leaves can be something along those lines is one of my favorites greg the great is really good too it's just they take such a wide kind of scope with their with the soundtrack it starts from like almost elevator music in your first in like your hub area and you go to like you know your standard grasslands kind of theme and then you go to a like a um what you call like an orchestrated soundtrack for the for chapter three which is like a big island with a volcano on it and then all these songs kind of come back together in your final chapter with complete remixes of each song which almost bring a new funk to the songs which actually that was 100 percent their point because each of the remix songs is called funky whatever version or whatever the name of the song was okay so let's go to the honorable mentions now and the first one is the game that got bumped because of under hero we are talking about it'll do uh, and i i had to look this one up but i looked at it and the thought it was very legend of zelda kind of old school legend of zelda vibe that's the look it had to me um, but then like that, it was a hand-drawn style and I thought of Binding of Isaac or Castle Crashers, just 
it's like it almost doesn't take it it doesn't take itself too seriously and it's kind of like it that's very that feels like the vibe of this game here so uh yeah it'll do is very very classic zelda style that was 100 percent what they were going for the whole game is filled with puzzles and stuff it's fun but like you said at first glance the game looks like it doesn't take itself very seriously and that is a hundred percent what it does the humor in this game is almost it almost makes fun of the things that don't make sense in zelda games like you walk along you 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 walk along with uh it'll and her flying fox companion tipsy who is drunk off of health potions constantly hence the name but you you walk through this dungeon and it'll does not take herself seriously or anything in the dungeon seriously she will argue with enemies uh make faces at statues uh burp the ap the abcs to annoy enemies um what else does she do she picks up a heart and eats it and tip, tipsy asks where she got it and the only thing she says is five second roll nothing about this game is taken seriously and that's a hundred percent what i love about it yeah i mean even one of the quotes is like oh so we just beat stuff up till this till we solve the puzzle got it and yeah it's like no, <laughs> yeah it's just all right let's just keep hitting things eventually something all right let's up. smash things yeah and uh in the second game they very much continue that humor uh in the final dungeon she literally one of the doors is locked so she goes around the side and breaks through the wall <laughs> they they stick with this not taking classic zelda very seriously humor and they do it very well so this is this is obviously kind of the theme especially here with the honorable mentions how do you how do you come upon all these indie games do you type in indie on steam and see what's showing up <laughs> recently or so how do you how do you get these so sometimes it is a case like that where i run through the steam queue and i find some stuff some of these come from indie world showcases that nintendo hold that i'm like that looks cool drop it on a wish list and then get it whenever it comes out but like for specifically it'll do that was just something i happened upon in the wii u eShop. It's just, I was scrolling through looking for fun games and I found it. I got it, loved it. And I have played through it probably over 20 times now. So, yeah. So are you play, and that's on the Wii U you played it, right? Because it, uh, it's, yep. it is on the Switch now. Initi- Yep, it's on the Switch. It's on PC. It's on pretty much every console. It's on I mobile. I did initially play it on the Wii U. It says it's on when mobile. It on mobile? That's what that that's what the info is saying here. So that's iOS. I don't know if it is both iOS or Android, but it does say oh, mobile. No, I, and I, and I kind of, <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, I am inclined to believe it that it'll do. Let's see. Look. It'll do. Okay, mobile. it doesn't doesn't show up when I search it in the App Store. Uh, it has a Google Play uh, review though. Okay, it's on it, Google Play. Okay, it, it is on Google Play. Yeah, it is at at least at least on Google Play uh 4.3 out of 5 on google play so you can play this right on your phone if you feel like it which i'm kind of doing a little more this is a five star game for you so like like this is just everything you want in a game how 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 strong of a five star is it'll do cool okay if i had to put it compared to like some of my top games of all time i would probably place it right around like the like maybe seven seven to ten like ten to seven range would probably be where i place it it's just overall fun it doesn't take itself seriously and at the end of the day that's what i want from a game i don't want to come home from whatever i'm doing being stressed out and play something that's going to stress me out or give me some dark depressing story i want something that i can come back to uh play and laugh about this, and I, it'll do does that very well. I f- I feel so attacked and unsafe right now in this conversation. The, I, I like this after the Firewatch conversation of like someone posting on like, am I going to feel better playing? No, that Firewatch is not a game you go to play if you want to feel happy. No, you're not going to feel happy. If don't you play that game. don't do it. 
I play clearly. I'm playing too many games where I don't feel happy afterwards. This, this is this my. It's just a me problem at this point. <laughs> All right, on to your second honorable mention, Angels with Scaly Wings. Uh, we're into the visual novel realm at this point. Again, I, I'm noticing the trend of uh, some clean, colorful animation. We've got some unique music to this game. Uh, so, again, just all the things that you have, all the all of the history you have at your fingertips, and this is the one that we go with for number two. So tell us about it. All right, so... Uh... If you're talking to me, you're not going to get away without me mentioning at least one visual novel. And Angels with Scaly Wings, I think, is it does a really good job at being for everyone. It it tells a really unique story. You're a you're, human who... Yeah, you're a human transported to the dragon world, basically, as an ambassador, yep, right? pretty much. Earth was destroyed by a uh, solar flare. And you were you're an ambassador, and you have to go to this other world to trade for efficient energy sources. At least that's what it starts out to be. You get further in, you start to meet different. Well, I guess I can't really say people. You meet different dragons, and you you start to get to know each of these different characters in their own way. Uh, eventually, uh, the other ambassador that's in the world with you uh, goes missing, and people start getting murdered. So it's you then have to basically survive in this world because you can't leave at this point. The portal shut down. You still need to complete what you came here to do. But you also have to find a way to spend your time. So you go and meet with each of these different dragons and you get to know them better. And you basically influence how you're going to end up or how they're going to end up. Have you played through this multiple times? Are there branches to the story? I mean, that's where some of the some of the older visual novels lose me. I'm, they're, they're less choose your own adventure and more just kind of reading through. I, where does this one go as far as giving you branching storylines, options, and kind of how things play out? So, so Angel of Scaly Wings kind of does this. Well, it does it in a somewhat unique way. Basically, your first playthrough, you can. there's no restrictions to what your first playthrough can be. The only restriction is it can't be the true ending. So you go through and you do whatever ending, good, bad, neutral, evil, of any character. Because each character has a good and bad ending. So you go through and you do these endings. And you find out that you are in a basically a, a time loop. Each time you complete this, you're going back to the moment that you stepped foot in the world. Because the only way you can get out of it is by getting to the true ending. So you have to go through and you have to basically save each of the different main characters. Because if you either don't follow their route or get their bad ending, they die in some way. Either off screen or because of your actions. So by getting each good ending, you kind of save them and lock them in without... So basically, they're not able to die once you get their good ending. So you're encouraged to play through each ending to basically try and get this perfect ending. And the true ending does a good job at wrapping it all up, giving everyone a happy ending. But they add in a little secret that you can kind of delve further into the lore of the game by going the extra mile after you've done the true ending. I I have to ask because again you you're, you've brought some very unique games to the table here. Um, this what what's the story for this one? Was this a YouTube? Was this a Steam deep dive? Was this a a studio that caught your eye or just a random recommendation? So this was one that I just kind of stumbled upon while looking for some other stuff it just kind of showed up as a search result on google and i was like what's this clicked on it and i was like that looks kind of fun uh got it and uh now i love visual novels <laughs> so it was just kind of a, a, a random happen upon and one more we'll mention we have pseudo regalia that's how i'm going to say this one um i think that there's people that are going to be happy that I say this because it's absolutely, it's a compliment of this game and it's definitely a shot at the uh, Nintendo 64. 
but I, I'm watching gameplay of this, and this is this is basically what Nintendo wished all their Nintendo 64 platformers looked like. That when I I played it, and I even like the walls of it, I was like, this was like what they were. This is what they hoped it was happening. It is a brand new game. This was last year, 2023. So uh, tell us about this game about a goat that walks on two legs. Because I also just played a, a new game that was a goat, a goat on two legs. Maybe that's just like the popular animal right now. Tell, <laughs> tell us about Pseudo-Regalia. So uh, Pseudo-Regalia is um, pretty platformer, uh, Metroidvania, style like an N64 game. And it does a really good job at doing that. I, it's, so the game does a really nice job at embracing its sequence breaks. Because there was, there's multiple times when I was playing it that I got to areas I definitely should not have been. And they almost encouraged me to get there without the required ability. I couldn't do anything there, but they encouraged me to get there. It's, it's it's a it's a short it's a short but sweet game. It's a lot of fun throughout the whole thing. I was able to beat it within I don't know four hours, but it's definitely one that I would recommend that people check out if they like three D platformers or Metroidvanias. Now, without because it's still a you know it's still a brand new game. It only came out last year. Without spoiling it, though, I know how it, it finishes. <laughs> how did you feel about the ending of this game? When you when you find out the ending, essentially, uh, that's tough. I guess, I guess I wasn't. I can't say I was satisfied, but I wasn't disappointed either. Okay, it was just kind of one that I was like, "Well, uh, that's that's an okay ending, I suppose. It's bad by any standards, but." Maybe not what I hoped for, although I guess I can't really say I knew what I hoped for. So I don't know. It's kind of kind of neutral on the ending. Overall. I will say, yeah, it's one of that that game. If if you know if people want to go play it again, it's short, so you know you can go through it and, and do it. But it's one of those endings that I think people like either really enjoy that type of ending or they get you know upset by it. Essentially, it's one of those. It's one of those choose a side kind of endings, the way the the twist of that one. But the play, the gameplay itself, like, very smooth, very like you you feel good about your platforming, right? You don't you're not upset that like wow this did not you know this didn't respond to me the way I wanted it to. Like everything feels the way it should. Yeah, it's it is very very smooth running game. It. Uh... The plat- platforming aspects of it almost remind me of Celeste in a way, where you can kind of like chain together your different moves and either gain a lot of distance or gain a lot of height. And it's, I don't know, the movement in it just feels satisfying. <laughs> There's no other good way to say that. It's just really, really satisfying for a platformer. All right, now we're going to talk about the future. A, a game that you're looking forward to. We're going to stay in the indie realm and go with a, a small independent sequel here. Uh, the Legend of Zelda Echoes of Wisdom. Uh, <laughs> so, doesn't, get small. doesn't get smaller than this. Right get, yeah. So hey, my favorite indie developer, Nintendo. Yeah, yeah. So I, I have been I've been on a uh, on my soapbox that Nintendo has has wisely decided yeah. to no longer announce games more than six months out. I thank them for their service there that they don't. Uh, allow anything to get overhyped in that regard that way. They don't allow people to get upset about extended development times. They may still take five years to develop a game, but guess what? Who cares? It's going to show up when they're going to tell us about when they're going to tell us about it. So we got this reveal in uh, a recent direct uh, from Nintendo. What was your reaction when they dropped this and and said, hey, remember when we did uh, the remake of Link's Awakening? We kept it. We're rolling with it. So honestly, at first, First glance, like the opening scene where Link's walking through the tunnel up to go fight Ganon and save Zelda, I was admittedly very disappointed. Because I I didn't... The remake of Link's Awakening was good. I thought it was fun, but I wasn't a fan of the art style. So going into another, like this classic styled Zelda game, which is something I've wanted for a really long time, or to see come back, is 
it was a little disappointed that it was in that same kind of art style. But the further the trailer went went on, and the more footage that we're getting to see, like as of recently, they dropped another uh, trailer video that shows yeah, some the, more game the class. traversal, the tra- how to how to traverse the countryside on the horse, yeah. basically, yeah. That I am increasingly becoming more and more excited, specifically because you know we can finally play as Zelda. This is actually the Legend of Zelda now. <laughs> And uh, hey, you don't have a CDI and all of that uh, in all of that gear hey, you've got in the house. I had a chance to get a boxed one once, but it was very, very expensive. You now have to so find that in the wind of the wand of Gamelon now as your punishment for the comment you just made. <laughs> I, I I have played a little bit of wand of Gamelon at uh, the Midwest Gaming Classic. So sorry to hear that. <laughs> I'm amazed Nintendo didn't send a, a, a an assassin out to take you down for that. I'm I'm surprised a lawyer wasn't there with a cease and desist if they uh if they knew that was happening. I've been avoiding them for the time being. No one give out my location. So uh, again, I think those cowards should have named this the Wand of Gamelon, not uh, not whatever whatever name they gave to to Zelda's uh, wand is not the Wand of Gamelon. I'm angry about that. But, the Tri Wand. Yeah, they they what yeah the Tri Wand. Whatever. No, you cowards. You should have taken it back. So any so anyway, so you're getting a mix of to your point, like you're getting some top down historical Zelda action. We're getting a mix of the the new literal shine they put on the game boy classic game and then you're also getting you know open figure it out you'll kind of work your way through this game i think there's you know there's not one path that you're going to be able to take uh in order how to defeat an enemy or solve a boss concern or i mean listen i'm sure they're play testing this one into oblivion but I'm right. sure there's you're going to be a week into this game, and someone's someone's going to be like, "I built 17 tables, and I went and fought the final boss, and or you know something something obnoxious like that." I built tables covering uh, high rule from east to west, and we have covered the entire space. There's going to be something like that there. So they're they're kind of mixing old and new, and and where right. how do you feel about that? And like where where is Zelda in your history that like uh, you're getting all these things colliding now? I this. I love that they're bringing back this like top-down classic feel. It's it's the Zelda I have known and loved for so long, but I love that they're bringing in this kind of modern feel. Like bringing in the ability to just kind of go anywhere whenever you want and uh traverse Hyrule by stacking beds because uh, I don't know. But why not? You're not going to stop me Nintendo. I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. <laughs> But the uh, the whole bringing in almost like a Breath of the Wild, Tears of the Kingdom feel to a classic game is really exciting to me. The being able to experiment with random objects that I get to find, like I don't know, I can take a potted plant and use that to block the wind, so I can walk through this tunnel. Or instead of blocking the wind, I could just build a staircase of beds again because if it ain't broke, don't fix it. And getting to copy enemies, I think, will be cool. But I'm not sure how much how much that's going to get utilized, speaking that you can, like, pick up enemies and drop them off a ledge or into a hole dug by another enemy. So I, I feel like there's some unique combinations that we could get there. But I don't know. It's... I'm very excited, but I'm also kind of mixed on how it's going to end up with players' creativity. Although, knowing Nintendo, they'll play test it and make sure that it, there's nothing that they don't want us to do that we can do. I I am sitting here. My unreasonable expectation for this game is trying to figure out what they're going to do because between uh, Tears of the Kingdom not telling us about the depths at all, that they had the trailers and everything was skybound and you thought that was going to be the game and skyward. I like it. all those skyward sword vibes. We were, we were talking about repeatedly with people and then you find out like, Oh no, they built the entire, they, they built a negative high rule 
underneath of the entire game. And then I, I loved Pikmin 4, and they hid 50% of the game after the credits. Like, you, you hit the credits, and like, no, no, you're not... You, you It actually may be like 60% of the game that's after the credits. Like, no, no, you think you beat the game. No, we got, we got another 50% of the game that's back here we didn't tell you about. And I feel like Nintendo has been consistently doing that to us, of like, no, 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 I know what you thought we did. We did this. And I'm just... I'm, right. I'm dying. I'm sitting here dying. I'm like, what are they going to... What are they going to do? Are we going to get Zelda? Uh, we're going to get Link in the Shadow World. I, I just want to know. Like, are we playing dual games at the same time? Are we not? How am I going to feel about that? Or is it just going to be Zelda? And either way, I'm content. I just I don't know what they're going to do now. I'm just I'm um I feel like I'm waiting for them to pull some kind of a trick on us because they've been doing that with everything. What was the one for one? There was something for Wonder too, Ray. That I was like, they they dropped this in here and didn't tell us, and I can't remember what it was. Wonder Wonder had something similar also. Well, I mean the what just the. The, oh, wonder the, the scope of the flowers, yeah. The wonder flowers themselves were sometimes felt like an extra half of a level with with entirely level. different play styles. Yeah, you had the you had the top, you had top down levels out of nowhere. Yeah. Um, oh no! Just, now the levels on the wall. Yeah, it was entire. That's yeah. what it was. It was just the the fact that they built like fifty seven different control scheme games hiding in the background of that. That was that was the one they hid in there. They they've been and doing it, this, and I'm waiting to see what they're doing. Now. And that the background was a level, but also there was some foregrounds that were levels in the game too. There was so many, there was so many pieces to each level. It didn't, even, it didn't make sense. That you could fit so much into it. All right. Well, Tor, at this point, we take a quest, a question from the Channel Three History Books, to pick for you to discuss. And I, I don't think I really asked this when we talked through your collection. So I'm, I, I usually prepare a few questions and decide where I'm going to go with it. But the one I want to ask you, what, what's your favorite piece in your gaming collection there? Oh, that's tough. I mean, my, my go-to thought is my one of two in existence, two point campus switch, but I feel like that's always my go-to. My, the world of Nintendo display cabinet is definitely up there too, because it just looks super freaking cool. But Mm. Wait, where did you while you're thinking about that, the, the two point campus, what was that like a giveaway, like a, a raffle prize or something that like you got a hold of? So yeah. So there uh a while back they teased that they were going to give away two themed switches and one themed Xbox. And eventually they gave away one and they and they gave away the Xbox and then they uh teased that they were gonna give away the other switch at some point. And it happened to be for the first DLC. So it was uh, submit your submit a space themed joke and have a chance to win. So I went in with a college space themed joke because I was like, that'll give me the best chance. It was, uh, why doesn't the sun need to go to college? Because it already has a million degrees. And uh, apparently that was funny enough that they thought I won. So uh, they sent me a switch. But that's not your answer. You're still thinking about something else. What's the thing that tops I, that? So it doesn't really top it anything in like rarity, but it has to be my reply letter from Nintendo when I sent them the a letter at the end of my first playthrough of Earthbound. At the end of the first playthrough of Earthbound, uh, you might know this, you can go back to the first drugstore and you can talk to Rafini the dog, who has the spirit of a game developer trapped in his body. And he tells you to write a letter to Nintendo and address it to Rafini the dog to uh, get a reply and kind of hear about some of the other upcoming games from uh, the developers of Earthbound. So... You know, back in, I think it was 93 that Earthbound released. Um, yeah, long you know, before you, you existed. This. Yes, I know. Yeah. <laughs> before Ray was born, too, Ray. I know, Ray. Relax. No, no, not 93. I was there. I was around already. Fine, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> so you could send in this letter, and uh, I think it was it was Etoy who would uh, send a reply. And uh, a handful of people did this and got uh some cool replies but you know i think this was 
2019, I want to say. The better yeah, part of three decades time. after the game came out, yes. Right. And I'm like, all right, what's going to happen if I send a letter to Rafini the dog at Nintendo of America? Are they going to send a reply? Are they not going to do anything? So I sent in a letter and they sent a reply. And it's, I mean, it, it, the reply wasn't anything special. It was like, thanks for playing Earthbound. We're glad you enjoyed it. Um, I think in that letter, I mentioned bringing Earthbound to the Switch. And they're like, uh, we'll take that into consideration. And then they were like, all right, uh, thanks. Here's some bookmarks. Uh, a po- little postcard. I think it was like uh, Mario bookmark and uh, Pokemon Sun and Moon uh, postcard because that's whatever they had left over to just send back to people. Yeah, whatever the panicking and- intern who said, what is this letter <laughs> that I have to respond to? Go go to the closet. Yeah. Let's see what we can give him. So I got that back and that's it's just a very like sentimental piece of the collection for me just because it's something from Nintendo. It, it's not really worth anything, but it's, it's just a really cool piece that Nintendo was they did actually sent me a reply regarding no, Earthbound and actually kind of talked about it. It's it's one of those cool things where like, you know, you hear all these stories about like Nintendo nailing somebody to the wall for you know, for, for pirating and selling their stuff, which again, let me be clear, there's a difference between somebody who's emulating it for themselves and someone who's selling someone else's stuff. And there's a lot of a lot of pieces of that. But then, like, you hear stories like, you know, the, the, what was it, like somebody's grandmother's Game Boy broke and they pulled one out of the warehouse that they had still sitting around. Or, like, again, you're talking about better part of 30 years later, someone, someone pulled the trigger and wrote a letter of this, like, one-off Easter egg hiding in the back of a Super Nintendo game. And to your point, I wasn't even thinking about the fact that was before they put the Super Nintendo online on the Switch. Right. So it wasn't like, yeah, you know, I mean, listen, they, I know they did, you know, ports through the years on the, the Wii and the, the right. Wii U and everything, but that's not, you know, that doesn't mean anybody really took the time to say like, oh, let me write a letter to this. And it may have been a panicking intern, like running to the promotional closet and grabbing whatever they had in there, which... Uh, hey, good for them, but that's still pretty cool that they stopped and took the time and like that could have gone into the round file and just like they threw it in the trash can and called it a day. Right. But it's just it's it funny that they did take some semblance of time to be like, listen, we committed to this thirty years ago. We are going to honor our commitments and then here we go. Yeah, it's it's nice to see that Nintendo despite how much uh some Ninten- some of us Nintendo fans may joke about how Nintendo doesn't care about us. They don't give us things that we want. But when you, it's like the little things like this that it just makes me love Nintendo so much. Do you do you have the letter still? I do. You'll you'll have it's, to. I mean, I, hide the hide the name and address and everything. But you'll have to you'll have to share that or and or if you DM it to me, that'll be the clue for the Monday before. I had a different clue in mind for the Monday before your episode drops, but now I'm like, no, maybe I gotta, you know, cut again, cut off the, the anything confidential on there, but that might be yeah, fun. I'll, to I'll, post I'll, uh, I'll totally, I'll totally send it over and, uh, and then I'll, I'll post it after uh, the episode here gets posted. But uh, yeah, it hasn't, you haven't been able to see it in any of the uh, collection posts I've done. Cause it's like, it's hidden behind the copy of earthbound. So no one's been able to see it so far, but uh, yeah, I'll send it over to you. And last question we ask everybody, what's been your favorite feature on channel three? Ooh, I, I gotta say just the quest, the quest overall has been my favorite. It, the quest give me an incentive to jump on and interact with the community each day, whether it's for just saying who would be a better, uh, wedding caterer or either cooking mama or uh, Dave the diver or uh, like the collection. That was such an incredibly stupid one I put together. (laughs) (laughs) I don't know what I was thinking. That's the, but that's, but that is the example that Toro went with. Like that was, that's the one that stuck out. That's the one, that's the one you went with. Oh God. Sorry. Continue on. You're talking about the quest. I just, the fact that you pulled that one out. (laughs) 
because I also had your one of the other options. I was going to ask you who the better moving help was between Link and Steve, but I was like, no, I need, and I'm glad I went with the one I went with. But I'm, that's so that's so ridiculous. You pulled out Dave the Diver and Cookie Mama. <laughs> but uh, yeah, the uh, the quest again just really gave me a point to interact with, and it really really makes me feel involved in everything, even when I don't have something to post that day. Yeah, it's true. Even even you bringing that up, like I never, I never know which ones are are gonna be hits and which ones aren't. I mean, I I'll, I put some up and thinking like, oh man, I came up with just the greatest question of all time, and five people answer it, <laughs> and then you know, there's, there's a throwaway one. That and and one of them's laughing, Brian, saying Fortnite. Yeah, and, but you get like one of the you get fifty responses to, and like these passionate answers about. And I was like, I put that in at one in the morning because I needed, I had a day with, with nothing on it. But apparently, that was that was what's on everyone's mind. So it's it is very funny how those how they work out. Yeah, I feel like, in part, to the uh, wedding caterer one as why that one stuck out to me so much was because that was one of the first ones that I answered. I think it was my second day on the site that I answered that one. Oh, thank God you stuck around. <laughs> <laughs> oh man and with that we've made it to the end of another what are you three podcast tor thank you for being our guest tonight you can find the podcast at c3.gg slash podcast dropping every wednesday morning at 3 33 a.m eastern on all the major platforms including spotify youtube music and apple podcasts i'm ray dan puts this all together our theme song is by caster garden and for our executive producer joel willis have a good day everybody Channel 3 is the future.